So welcome back to the second video in this series. And so what we've done is we've gotten these bikes to where they're running. We've rebuilt the carburetors. I'm still waiting on a few little pieces, uh, carburetor pieces for the 200. Uh, and I also ordered a, a Japanese or Chinese aftermarket carburetor because it was very inexpensive and I'm just going to put it on see what it does but these two OEM carburetors are running really well so got them back in and I've cleaned up a little bit just to get me to a point where I can actually start to disassemble without getting my hands completely greasy so this is the 185 We've got some decisions to make on whether or not we're going to do this or that. But it runs, shifts, just like the 200. Now, I'm obviously, I'm going to need a seat cover. And I'm going to attempt to save this plastic because you can't find... 185 plastics you know you can buy them new uh, aftermarket but the only thing that's wrong with this one is there's just a crack right here and I've got the plastic welder and as long as it doesn't deform it too badly I'm going to give this a try and try and save this 185 plastic I've got some new stickers for the back, the sides, and these, these tires are original and I'm, I'm not going to change those because I think I would rather have it come to me with as much proof as possible about the condition and the age and you know just the use and if it's got the original tires then you at least know that it hasn't been driven enough to put on a new set of tires now this is the 200 and i've got all these parts cleaned up we're going to paint the rear rack now the seat came out nice underneath And I think that will probably be good to go, as well as the front fender and the mud flap. The rear toolbox still has the graphics on it, so I'm going to probably try to save those. So the first step is the pull starters. And the reason I did that is because you you got to have them to start the bike. I wanted to make sure that they would run and shift down the road and all that because everything else I can I can do, um, but internal engine stuff I can do that too. But it just adds almost double the time to the restoration if they run and they run good, which these do. That's half the battle. The rest is just getting it cosmetically put back together. So, pull starters are the first thing. And I've been working on the pull starters for quite a while now. And I'll show you where I'm at. I have restored the pull starters. There's a whole video that I'm going to download or is downloaded already onto YouTube on how I did that. And here are all the pieces, all the new pieces, some original pieces for the second pull starter. And now let me show you this is a completed, this one's completed. It's got the 
decompression cable that all operates as it should the pull starter and the housing with all of the new stuff I also have some Honda OEM these are screws for the back plate that go on the back this is the plate it goes on the back of the pull starter but these I find it interesting some of the time sometimes you get some things that you can just get new at Rocky Mountain or Partzilla and other things that you can't find at all so I mean I would expect these little indicators this is a little indicator that goes on the side I would expect that to not be available and they're available so I got two of them so they're they go right here and they point to the end so if you need any more on the pull starters there's a whole video so now let's get to disassembling and getting down to a either a cleanable spot where the motor's still in the frame or pull the motor out completely and just get everything clean touched up or repainted so let's get going on that we're going to try to assess whether or not we're going to order plastic so this has got scratches typical scratches and really what it came down to is this part here now I've already started to repair this I'm going to be able to get from the back and strengthen it I've got a plastic welder and then you've got this mesh that you cut to size and fit behind this and now you can see where I have buried the mesh in melted plastic and I'm moving my way up now that's going to give it the strength and so let's continue on up so the first step is to melt this mesh into the plastic so I'm going to start it right here and it takes a while so I'm going to wait until I've got it completely melted into the plastic and then I'll come back so I've got it melted here and if you put a little pressure on it it'll eventually it does it a little faster I'll melt that in there and I'm going to try and make this complex curve and the trick is to do it without affecting the outside like with a like a bubble or a heat bubble or something so that's melted there I'm going to probably hit it right here get it where it just holds itself because then we're going to go over the top of it with this plastic I cut into strips and I took this off of a little ATC 125 fender that I have as scrap and this in case you need to know it's right on the front here it says that this plastic is PE or LDPE and it's for ATC fenders, gas tanks, overflow tanks, kayak, that sort of thing. So now that's melted on and then I'm going to just get hit the end of this here. Okay, so it's all spotted basically. So what I'm going to do here is just melt some of this plastic get it on there let's see just kind of work it 
it's a slow and tedious process to get the top of that metal with a little bit of plastic on it but you also got to melt it into the plastic fender and then just smooth it out and it's kind of a feel thing to how hot to get it how much plastic you really need but to me it doesn't have to be pretty on the on the back although you don't want it to look really bad but it's the top that is the you know the money so I've got it all the way up to here and I'm going to probably go back and do a little touch up maybe maybe completely bury this mesh not sure this is all I've got left is this area right here and we'll get to the front which is really all that matters this is going to structurally you know this this crack was not going to crack again you know this is good this is strong the mesh is melted in so the crack is repaired but it's cosmetics that's going to keep me from using this fender if it if it's too noticeable but i don't think it's going to be so that's that's smooth so let's turn it over well the parts manager wants to come inspect he's gonna have to make the decision we can't come up with a decision here so you know, I don't have any, I, I haven't got any go-go juice on this plastic yet, which in this camera, through the camera, it almost looks orange, but it's, it's the Honda Red. In person, this is the Honda Red. So, you know, with the surface scratches, but when you look, you know, it's so far down. It's going to be hard to see that. It's not going to be glaring in your face. And some go-go juice on that is going to make this more of a red color instead of the dry, faded, scratchy. And the new sticker on the side, it, it's, going to, it's going to look good. So we're probably not going to order a rear fender. Now, I'm going to probably have to repair this with the plastic welder. Um they must have this one i believe is factory so they put whatever they had on there because over here you can see these these look factory these don't look like this has come off at all now this i'm going to repair from the back side i'm going to push it together i'm going to repair it but out of everything that one didn't look near like this one when this was not fixed. So let's pull the flaps off and uh, get the screws on the order list and fix this crack here and move forward. So I just pushed the crack together as hard as I could with my hands and then I just used the edge of that hot iron to kind of spot it. And now I'm gonna repeat the process of the other, just putting the, uh, the mesh on it, melting it in and then covering it over with some more red plastic. Now after I took off the mud flaps, you can see that is the hole and how it's supposed to be. And this is the rear holes. And you can see how there's like a little indention. Now this one, this one's all wasted. So I'm gonna build these up. Now the other side isn't as nice. 
I'm seeing these being okay. That one, that one looks okay. I might have to put some backing washers on them. They look a little bit big. This one looks okay, but this is definitely, this needs to be repaired. And then that's the repair I did here, which is looking good. Let's repair these holes. And now the holes are, they're fixed. I built them up and then all I'm going to do is get the size here of the drill or size of the hole and just put a hole back in that. So they all look nice. They all look good, and this one was beat up pretty good. And that'll blend in once it cools down. It's really hot, so it gets dark when it gets hot. But there again, I'll just put a new hole in there right where it's supposed to go, and then it is ready for mud flaps. And While we're waiting for parts on the 185 rear fender, it's time to start on the seat. Now I found one on eBay, a seat cover. So he wasn't real clear or sure whether or not it's going to fit. So we're gonna see. First thing is to get this old one off. So this, it's got a little bit of plastic on it. So what's, what's that telling me? It's telling me that this seat cover has been replaced before. But the plastic, even though it's filthy, none of the tabs broke off. And, you know, you usually have a couple that break off. Get this seat cover out of here. And actually, they only used the plastic... Yeah, maybe it was maybe it was all plastic. I mean, that's an old trick. You line the foam with plastic. It makes it easier to stretch, so the foam doesn't like want to grab onto the seat seat cover. All right, so we got that off. All right, so I'm gonna need to clean this up. Even though this is covered by the, you know, it's bolted to the rear fender. You really don't see this. There's no reason you got it out. I mean, that's what restoration's all about. Don't hide things. Just do your best, right? So let's see, I think, in fact, I already know because I tried to pull it off and it came off. The seat foam comes off really nice. That's, that's as good as it gets for one piece so you know it's got definitely rust I'm gonna do my best clean it up I'm gonna spray it with the rust inhibitor and then I'm gonna spray it black Get all that shit off of there now the seat pan is cleaned up I took wire brush to it out in the wash bay Got it kind of cleaned up. It's still going to be rusty, but that's okay. It's still rigid. It's still got all the form to it. And I cleaned up this little piece of protective uh, plastic that goes along this edge. So now I want to see if that seat cover is going to fit. There's the foam. And now. Now let's get the seat cover. So here it is, and this is big. Having that Honda on the back is big. Now we, we kind of took a little bit of a look at it on the tailgate where I picked the seat cover up and it looked like it was gonna fit. Yeah, it definitely is. Definitely looking like it's going to be a 
laying on there nice. Sun, these lines will come out because it, this is supposedly it's an OEM seat cover. But is that Honda center? go that way a little, but that puts this stitching off a little. So, pretty quality seat cover. It's cut really well. Yeah, this is going to fit on there. It's going to fit on there just like it should. So, I'll just have to split the difference. I think this Honda, I think this Honda emblem is offset. I think it's set off this way a little bit. I'm not sure, but we'll find out when we get it on. First, we got to paint the pan. I used, this is a Summit rust transformer and rust converter. I used the converter on the back side here, on the, this is rust converter. And it definitely, it isn't even quite dry and it's turning the rust kind of a you know, a black color. And it's still sticky. Ooh, it's sticky. And now I'll flip it over. And this side is the Summit. And I don't know, I think the, the VHT rust converter, I think kind of did a better job. But this says it takes longer to dry, so I'm gonna give it its second coat, which is also not, the, the other, the other side has all its coats. I think it's three coats or two coats. So we'll put it on here, and this supposedly will turn black off. And there it is with its final coat. So I'm going to let that sit a couple of days, maybe even longer, and then we'll see what it looks like. It's been five days, and it doesn't necessarily look much different. Um, maybe, maybe it does. I have to look at the other video. But I still see it, like, looking a little rusty. But it's encapsulated. This, this is strange. It turned like a clear. But we're gonna, we're gonna coat it. We're just gonna, we're just gonna... Spray over this and uh, see what, you know, we're, we're really just protecting it because you don't see this at all on the bike. So let's go ahead and spray this with some black paint. This is what I chose to use on the seat that you actually can see, the part of the seat that's showing if you pull it off. The other was just some paint I had left over that I put on the side where the foam is gonna to glue to. You'll never see that again. So let's see how this works out. And that's it right there. And I believe that's also the number. All right, it came out great. Um, it's a little tacky. So I'm going to wait and put the seat cover on everything else on it in a couple of days. I'm going to give it a couple of days to dry. So in the meantime, 
what we're going to do is we're going to start to disassemble this. And uh, I've got my lift here and I've got this little jack underneath it. I'm going to try and figure out a way to put some sort of side skirts on it. I know they make them, but I'm going to see what I can do about just putting a rear sky, you know, skirt, something that'll bring the lift out a little wider so I can get these three wheelers on safely. But I'll see how the jack works. The jack might just work fine. At this point, I'm going to take a lot of pictures so I can go back through those and get all this wiring correct. And then we're going to pull off this exhaust first. So I've got a lot of the stuff off the back here. One thing I wanted to check out and see is if this was original. And this is all original. These have never been off. You can see the goldish color. And there's good and bad in that. First of all, it's good that nobody's been in here to mess things up and everything is all totally restorable. But I'm going to have to put a chain and sprocket on it. Look at that step in that chain. Or excuse me, the sprocket. Wow. So I'm doing a couple of different things with the wiring harness and I'm going to do this because these are original. These are just beautiful. They're in great shape. These, these holders, you know, basically they hold the wiring harness and cables to the frame. So I'm taking pictures and notes of exactly where it goes back. And then I'm twisting using little twists to attach them to either the wiring harness or the brake lines. When they're this original and and the bike is just, you know, it's just so clean. It, I mean, it, to me it's clean because there's literally nothing that's been touched chain and sprockets, tires, everything. They literally rode it until the pull starter stopped working or they pulled it out of the handle, pulled the handle out of the pull starter. So that's a, a great thing, a great time for restoration. All right, let's take the rest of this stuff apart and try and get this motor out. Now everything's out, all the bolts holding the motor. So next thing to do is just pull this out of the front. All right, let's see if I can lift this out of here. You can see him focusing on the breathing there. Just trying to calm that heart rate. There it is. Now that the engines out I can pull the bottom foot peg holder here or foot peg mount and I'm gonna get the axle out I'm gonna either grease or replace the bearings and then we'll move forward to the front steering head and the front but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get the other foot peg off while I can still hold it tight. I'm not going to pull this off till I get that off. So I've got just about everything off. And the bearings feel good. But I am one of those guys that just has to take everything apart. <laughs> so I could probably remove these and remove the axle as a whole piece, which I probably will end up doing anyway. But I am reading a few things online, a couple of videos, and they're saying, oh, it's just gonna be horrible and terrible. Um, you'll never get this nut off. I put an adjustable open end on it, and then I held 
the axle here. And it was snug, but it came off. Now I'm sure that some of these are just rusted to hell and there isn't any getting them off, but so far so good. So let's get this axle out. Of course, PB blaster. But what I found here, this was the first nut was real easy, relatively easy. This nut, much harder. What I ended up having to do was work it back and forth. Going, loosening, tightening, so I could work some of that PV blaster in it. Because what I think is inside is some thread locker, factory thread locker. And once I got it, maybe a turn, a whole turn or two turns, it started to come. And I'm going to get it off of here and I'll be able to show you. These are specialty Honda tools, by the way. Sure they are. So let me get it all the way off here. See if I can do this. Not too much trouble. Because I'm seeing right now, there is some black stuff, which is probably thread locker. And that was tight. So I don't know if it's going to be a problem getting these shims off. But it's really built up right here. You can see that. And that's serious. Unless that's a rubber O-ring, which it almost looks like more of an O-ring. So we're going to have to go to the parts fish and see what that's all about. Now, what I did here is I've got the two nuts off. I pulled some plastic around, some rubber. I believe it's a seal that's in the end of this hub. I can replace that. I started tapping a little too hard on here, so I can't get this threaded back on. What a rookie mistake. So I'm going to have to buy a, a die, tap and die set that's got this size in it. Big deal. No problem. So instead of tapping on the end of this, I threw the hub on, put a socket in that, that's pressing against the hub and not any splines or anything. Because this is blind, and I believe it's a little rusty, but a couple of love taps, and it went through. So now I can get the brake hub off. I'm going to be able to check that. And I can get the axle out. is out. Now that the axle's out, we can inspect the bearings. Now you can't see it because I'm not going to move the camera, but you can't even hear this thing move and I can't feel anything with my finger. This is like brand new. This bearing is in great shape. Oh, listen to that. Oh, it's hanging up on narfed up ball bearings oh that's horrible but in shingle town that would be acceptable service limit there uh yeah just button her back up yeah good to go in shingle town but not here so i got a new bearing got to get a new bearing and a new seal and uh the brakes, I'm going to do the uh, 
measurement on these and see if I need new brake shoes. I'm sure I don't need a new drum, but I'm going to go ahead and mic it too, just to make sure. So let's get the rest of this torn apart. And the idea is to get this frame down because it's not, it's just not good enough for a restoration. It needs paint. It needs to be painted. And I'm, I'm so close now that there's no reason not to pull it out, sand it down a little bit and paint it up, make it look nice. And that way everything else that goes back on just looks, just looks beautiful. So I scraped off some of this corrosion and got to the brake lining and you have to just kind of get down and see where we are on thickness and we're at 364 and two is minimum. Let's just try another little area here that might look a little thinner. But actually, they all look good. And I think the thinnest is right... Yeah, it's definitely... Right in here is the thinnest. This would be... Close to it, right in here. That might be a little smaller, but that's still three, three and a half. So we're well within the spec on the brake shoes. So what I did is I might, the brake drum and it, I had to scrape can see there's buildup, that's just dirt. But you can see right there where I scraped it down. And I, all I could do is kind of eyeball it because I don't have an inside micrometer. But I don't I think this is original. But I know it is. I mean, this is this has not been off. Um so this is original. This is original. They're in good shape. I'm just going to clean them up. This is well within limits. This looks to be, you know, I, I got it really close. And it's actually smaller because of a little bit of the buildup here than the original. So I know for a fact this is well within the limits. So we've got the brakes off. We're going to pull this seal. We're going to pull this bearing. This seal did not want to come out of there and I used my larger seal puller this is my smaller one and really had to find a way to put some leverage on it and it popped out all right it's out feels better out than it did in but it's out needs a new one so I'm going to pull the brake, probably pull the brake, and the rear axle housing, and get that chain cover off, and this whole half of the frame is completely stripped. We're getting closer to having this frame off. So this fork leg was a real bear to get out. And this one is coming out much easier because I can actually get to it uh, without the wheel on it. But this axle nut or axle is threaded into this fork leg here. And the typical problem is that you can do an impact all you want on the end of this axle and it's just corroded to a point where you just can't get it out. So the way you get around that is to take this other fork leg off and that allows you to pull the wheel and the tire. And then I can service this. I mean, it's gonna be a pain, 
but I can work with it. I'm going to also try to put some, you know, PB blaster on here and let it sit and do all the things you normally would do, but I can tell you it's probably not coming out. So, the only limiting factor is if the brakes are out of service specs, and they're not. They are within specs. Now, they're not, they're not new, but that has not hit the replace mark. So, I think there's probably 40% brake left on there. Let's get the rest of this front fork set up. Okay, I've got the frame completely off. Got everything out of it. That's all ready to get cleaned up and assessed. And then I am looking at these races and I just wiped them down a little bit. But it was smooth. Even without the wheel and axle and all that weight, forks, all that, when it was just the triple clamp here, it was a smooth spinning uh, situation. So it told me that probably these races, you know, will work, will go back together. I mean, this is not going to be a, a bike that someone's going to put another 300 hours on. I mean, it basically, time is its worst enemy and non-service, but these, these races are in really good shape given their age. And I normally replace them, but this is as nice as I've seen. You know, normally there's a lot of pitting and the ball bearings have pitting on them, but they're they're really in great shape. I mean, I look at them with a magnifying glass, and there is no pitting at all on these bearings. And this, and the races are in surprisingly good condition. So I think this will go back together, and uh, be every bit as good as. We got the pressure washer out. We did a little pressure washing. And we did a little cleaning. Got all the grease off. We're down to metal. Ready to do a little sanding. And then we can take it to the paint booth and paint it. And if you wanna see how I clean these frames you can look at my other videos. I'm not exactly sure which one, but um, I think that I went into detail on a few of them. So you can look up those. And now let's get this thing ready. All right, for this frame, I'm going to use the Summit Chassis Shield. I've got 12 ounces mixed here. I'm going to filter it and put it in my cheap little gun that does an excellent job. I've got everything taped off. I'm really trying hard to save this sticker. They make aftermarket ones, but I think the original is so much better. And you got everything ready to go. There's not a lot on this compared to, there's more square area, but there's not as many parts as a normal restoration on a, like a GS1000. The second coat is on, and now we just sit and wait. I like to wait at least a few days before I try and touch these because they're just easier to work with when you get about four days or more of dry time. Otherwise you're gonna get fingerprints in the paint because it's still soft, so. 
And there they are. And that skid plate. It's going to look good underneath that frame. So, I really like the Summit chassis shield. In this, in this video, you're going to pick up every imperfection and it also hasn't had a chance to dry. But you can see that even the factory, because this is factory paint, I did not paint the inside of this, it has orange peel. But if you look at this, there hardly is any orange peel in it and it'll even get flatter as time goes on. So this is probably gonna take about four days before I touch them, two to three days. And that rear axle, isn't that gonna be nice? Be able to look down at that axle and everything else all nice and detailed. It's gonna be nice. Here's a picture of the order list. I always put down the part number, the Honda part number if I can. And then where I ordered it, that would be Rocky Mountain. And that would be eBay. And then I circle it when I've actually ordered it and how much it was. These are just kind of check-in prices. And I ended up ordering all of those. There's another sheet here. And this is for both of the 200S and the 185. But, as you can see, there's a lot of little nitpicky parts. But it's an important part of the process. So this will end this segment of the video. And the next video will be just uh, basically assembling the bike. Probably doing the seat. Because believe it or not, it's been about four days and the seat is still tacky. So this, this stuff dries quicker though. So we're going to pick this back up. The 185S 1983 Honda. We're going to pick this back up on the next video. So for those guys in Shingletown, it's starting to look like a really nice bike. Something that you would probably love to tear up in, in the back hills up there in Shingletown. So I'll see you on the next video.